Good afternoon and welcome to our Keys News Special in aid of the Joseph Salmon Trust. I'm Rachel Williams. And I'm Jimmy Mackerel. On Wednesday, the, the first Conservative Queen's speech in nearly two decades promised an EU referendum by 2017. More powers deserve devolved to Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland and the so-called Snoopers Charter. Joining us in the studio is our political correspondent, Oliver McKenzie. So, Oliver, what will these bills mean? Well, you've pretty much just hit the two key issues on the head. The devolution, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland getting the first na national bills in their history. Scotland will get public spending over 50% of its annual budget. And also the European Uni Union, we now know that there is going to be a referendum on whether we stay or leave. And uh, this EU referendum then, what are David Cameron's options for that referendum? Well, we know there's going to be one. The question is now, when is it going to happen? Because before the election, as you remember, David Cameron said he would not actively seek a third term. And I'm sure he was thinking that 2017 with an EU referendum would probably be an optimum time to leave. However, with some backbenchers calling for 2016 now, bringing it a year forward, he might sort of shift it a bit further forward, alter his plans, to silence his backbenchers and, uh, and enable a more smooth transition of power for a next Prime Minister, say if that was George Osborne or whoever, we couldn't speculate at the minute. And uh, what else came up in the, in the Queen's speech then, Oliver? Well, the other, major sort, the other major issue was welfare reform. If you remember, the Tories promised £12 billion worth of cuts before the election. In context, probably to negotiate off of another party to form a coalition government. Of course, now we have a Tory party in full form, and those £12 billion worth of cuts need to happen from somewhere. Pensions have been ring-fenced, so that really sort of leaves child benefits, child tax credits to be caught. Whether, they, whether the Tories will actually go for that and bring back this nasty party connotation, it could happen, it could not. They might sort of drift to the right a bit, and that, that might happen. Okay, no problem. Well, thanks very much, Oliver, for, for that. And we'll have more on that at our six o'clock bulletin. Full employment was an ominous message in the Wednesday's Queen's speech. But what would full employment mean? Gemma Crozier reports on the rise of zero-hour contracts and their effect on insecure working conditions. In tough economic times, most people just want to secure work to pay the bills each month. That may mean working under a zero-hour contract. Over a million people are on call to work for a company as and when they are needed. Across the region, thousands of workers face a daily struggle with no guarantee of work. Sinead has been on such a contract for the past year, working as a singing teacher in the North West. I can't for definite say that I can do things. I've got to be so careful regarding that I've got this much left, I might not get paid for another 28 days, I've got to make that last me. I can find it quite hard because from day one that I send my invoice in for the work that I've actually done, there's 28 days from then onwards that I could be paid. Recent figures show one in five employers are using zero hour contracts. Among them are Boots, Buckingham Palace and Sports Direct. The oldest and the youngest are most likely to be employed on zero hour contracts and 14% don't have enough to get by on them. With the elections just around the corner, this issue has become a talking point. I don't think they're very fair on the people which have to take these offers up. If say you got like 16 hours and they dropped it to 12 or say eight hours, then that parent has then maybe, their tax credits will get affected. Because um, I'd like to actually know if I have hours or not, whether or not I have to wait because you never know if I could be lying on next month's rent or something. Whether or not these contracts are a reflection of our economic times, zero-hour contracts are set to become ever more common, particularly to oldest and youngest in the workforce. Gemma Crozier, Keys TV News. A University of Salford co-commission was part of the new arts venue Homes opening exhibition. The £25 million Pounds Arts Centre had its official launch this week, with train spotting director Danny Boyle speaking at the event. The film called The Most Cruel of All Goddesses joins other commissions at the merger between the Corner House and the Library Theatre Company. New Chancellor Jackie Kay welcomed the collaboration between the university and home. 
in a, in a unique and, and different way, I hope, and I'm just really excited to see what the conversation will be like between the University of Salford and Home, how we will jointly help and support each other to do the things that we all believe in very, very firmly, and that is put create, create, creativity at the very centre and the core of our being to make all of our lives richer and all of our lives fuller. Now, the Bank, of the Bank of England is searching for a leading figure in the visual arts to replace economist Adam Smith on the £20 note. People being asked to nominate are deceased artists including architects, designers, filmmakers, photographers and painters to grace the currency. Famous Salfordians eligible include artists L.S. Lowry and a Taste of Honey playwright Sheila Delaney. Nominations can be made on the Bank of England website and they close on the 19th of July. Manchester City Council bosses have defended spending thousands of pounds dealing with a homeless protest in the city centre for a number of weeks. Activists have been camping outside of Albert Square and St Peter's Square after the Town Hall have cut £2 million from its homelessness funding in the last year. Our reporter Alex Worthing visited the camp to investigate. The amount of men, women and children being put out onto the streets is on the rise. Cuts to various government funds means that the number of homeless shelters are in decline, not only in Manchester, but across the country. Well, these, these guys need homes. I mean, there's, there's been an increase of 50% in homelessness in the last five years in Manchester. Now, whether that's to do with cuts in, in public funding or whether it's the approach of the way we deal with homelessness that needs to change, that's, that's something that needs to be worked on and, and strategies need to be developed. A scheme set up to help people cover some of the cost of housing, known as DHP, has been cut. In the North West, spending has been reduced 7% from 15.5 million in 2013 to just over 14 million this year. The uh, response in different areas is so different. Like Man Manchester's is the worst in, in all over the UK. In Glasgow, you get, you're out for one night, you get to be home the day after. I've heard um, a, a guy what, what? told me to go to Belfast. Yeah. He said if I go to Belfast, I'll spend one night on the streets. Yeah, like the next thing. night, one I'll night be out, given a one, place. One night out only. We approached Manchester City Council for an interview, but they declined to comment. One charity believes that derelict buildings like this one could be converted into shelter at little or no cost to the government, which would see hundreds of people put back into accommodation. Alex Worthing. Keys TV News. Greater Manchester Fire and Rescue Service took on the opportunity uh, to remind Coronation Street viewers on how to tackle house fires. During the broadcast, where a large fire was created by character Tracy Barlow, the fire service tweeted, Don't try to tackle a big fire yourself like Leanne just did. Call 999 immediately and firefighters will be there within minutes. They finished the evening's tweeting with last hashtag Cory tweet of the evening and probably the most important working smoke alarms save lives. If you don't have one, call 0800 555 815. So uh, you're a bit of a Cory fan yourself, Rachel. I believe I believe you've got a bit of inside I knowledge am, on how seriously people were taking the, the tweets from the fire well, service. Well, this was the first biggest disaster um, in the new set. Obviously, they've moved from Deansgate now into Media City. Um, and residents nearby actually called uh, the fire services to come to the set because they didn't realise what was actually happening. Well, that just goes to show how believable Cory is then. It, it does indeed. Now... Being transgender is something that affects just 1% of the population. Penny James asks, are attitudes changing and, um, and what is helping to progress the transgender community? Transgender. It might be a word you're familiar with or you might be clueless. Put simply, it means to change gender. It's an issue that's talked about more and more these days with figures like Bruce Jenner in the media. But what do people really think? I like them. Let them do what they want to do, you know what I mean? It's their life, it's not harming me. Why, why would I have anything to say about it? Uh, transgender people. <laughs> oh, men who dress as women. It's just a, a common type of person that occurs in society. One has to be like boys and girls, you know, 
So transgender is bad for me. Regardless of opinion, the transgender community are recognised as a minority that need to be protected by law. So I'm a member of the Parliamentary Forum on Gender Identity and the main purpose of that is to try and influence the legislators to understand and include trans in everything they do. It was 1999 before we got any legislation protecting trans people. The most important legislation since then includes the Sex Discrimination Act that protects transgender people at work, the Gender Recognition Act that gives legal status to someone's new gender, and the Equalities Act that stops legal discrimination. But what would it be like without these protections? Well, I believe there'd be just as bad discrimination as there was when I was a young person. It would mean people would be much more scared and find it much harder to come out. It would mean people would continue to lose their jobs, would continue to be discriminated against legally. Another major step has been made by the BBC, who have just filmed the UK's first transgender sitcom, Boy Meets Girl, starring a transgender actor. If you see a representative from your community on a large screen or on your TV and you feel a connection with that person and you think, I, I relate to that, that person, she's going through, she's been through something that I've been through, then... TV all of a sudden is, is serving its, its purpose in, in society. So things are changing, but what's next? To me still, one of the most important is education. And it's about teaching our children not to be discriminatory. Not only will they grow up with a better understanding of equality and diversity, but they'll go home and tell their parents. Society's views are changing. The transgender community have come a long way, but there's always room for greater understanding and acceptance. Now I'm sure you've all heard of the Daleks and that blue police box. Well, Doctor Who is the longest running sci-fi series in television, celebrating 52 years on the air. A college in Stockport is delivering a course on how the much loved pro oh, delivering a course about the much loved program. Our reporter Lois Martin travelled through time and space or took the 192 bus to investigate. I'm at Aquinas College which has a wide range of adult learning courses. Today I'm here to find out about one of the newest additions which is guaranteed to take you out of this world. Doctor Who celebrated its 50th anniversary last year and has a huge following around the world. Now, a college in Stockport is offering learners a chance to find out more about the mysterious Doctor. Well, the idea of the class is to explore the history of the programme from 1963 onwards, to look at how it was developed um, by Sidney Newman in the spring and summer of 1963 and with Verity Lambert as producer, and, uh, and basically to tell the, the, the story of the show, all the sort of ups and some of the downs, the 12 Doctors and the many companions and the hundreds of episodes, all in 11 weeks. Uh, Michael's been teaching here for a couple of years now, doing the, uh, the Radical Women's History, which he's an expert in. And we thought it would be nice to do something a little bit different. And he came to us and he said he's got all these different ideas, and one of them was Doctor Who. And we thought, why not? I can imagine there's a, a lot of Doctor Who fans in the local area and in the world who'd be uh, keen to sort of uh, come along and, and see what he's got to say. Total extermination. Each week, students explore a different Doctor's era. What well, we find it's interesting, it's not just the stories that we're concentrating on, we're finding out behind the production and the inspiration behind the conception of Doctor Who. Lois Martin reporting for Keys News from the TARDIS. We're now a third of the way through our 15 hours on air in aid of the Joseph Salmon Trust and I'm sure most of our crew are running on caffeine. It comes as no surprise that Tom Deegan is reporting on the new coffee shop in Oldham. Pay a visit to your local coffee shop, you might expect them to be looking for profit. But this coffee shop set up by drug and alcohol treatment service Acorn is very different. Well, you know, we are a coffee shop, primarily, but the concept is, is buying something on, so you come in and you make a donation, so you get your coffee, but then you can either leave a voucher or you can pass it on to somebody else. I don't think I've ever seen it really done. I know places do like pending coffee and stuff like that, but this is sort of promoting doing something else for somebody else. 
But who is it aimed at and why is it so important to have a cafe like this? We don't want this just to be solely for recovery. We want, we want people to integrate. We want people, you know, normal people to come in and, you know, and see what we're doing here. It's not like, oh, this is a recovery cafe. It's a community cafe. So we want everybody out of the community to come and use this space. You know, whether they be homeless or drug addicts or somebody who's working as a solicitor down the road, we want everybody to come in here. Jimmy Carter, a volunteer, explains how the cafe is helping him. I'm learning new skills, I'm learning to meet new people, and it's a fun environment, it's friendly people. Do you think yeah, more places in the UK should adopt to this? Definitely, yeah. Um, it, you know, it's something that we're already looking at sort of developing. Um, we're looking at sites over in Bay Cup, and you know, we're primarily in the northwest, and we'd love to be sort of get this place running and doing well, and then look at Manchester and look at all other places. Um, with all the coffee shops I've been to, this is definitely something different. Thomas Deegan reporting for Keys TV News, Oldham. FC United of Manchester will be celebrating their 10th anniversary with a friendly against Portuguese club Benfica. The club formed in 2005 against the Glazer takeover of Manchester United. FC United will be hosting Benfica in their new £5.5 .5 million stadium, Broadhurst Park. Kickoff is at 7.45. I think this shows what football supporters can actually do when they have a vision of something different and when they come together uh, with, a common, uh, with a common purpose. I mean, the f I think, you know, that commitment of, of, of the supporters to actually get this facility developed shows that you can actually achieve something when people come together, when ordinary people come together and try and make a difference. Well, some FC United fans have had a bit of fun at promoting the game. They have dressed statues and monuments in the city centre with FC United hats and scarves. I didn't realise that Abraham Lincoln was a Reds fan. With craft beer and novelty brewing rising in popularity, one Salford entrepreneur received a £10,000 grant to start his own brewery. With a twist, Lewis Smith has more. These warehouse doors may not seem out of the ordinary, but behind them lies a brewing laboratory to tickle the taste buds of any fermentation fanatic. Meet Aaron Dark, the mastermind behind a unique drinks company selling alcohols made with all natural ingredients. In October, Aaron won a £10,000 grant in the Ideas Town competition, money he's now used to establish his own brewery. This entire space here, which is in sort of brewers, like, or start off brewers' mind, is perfection. It's got good water access, it's got electricity, um, wide open space. It's, you know, without this, without Test Town, um, this sort of push forward would not have been possible. Aaron sources his own unique ingredients, exotic honeys from around the world, rare malts and even his own yeast compound to create something slightly different from your average tipple. Even the brewing process itself is different to his commercial counterparts. The hops that I use, I, I use probably about maybe 40 times more hops than what your sort of standard brewers like Boddington's or um, you know, any sort of like the Royal Brewery. A uh, place like that, they, um, they don't really use that many different types of hops. Um, so the idea here is that we can create so many different types of flavours. Like I've got eight different types of fermentation vessels and I can turn those over quite quickly with different flavours. Um, but also, people like a sort of small artisanal scale and they're more willing to try different things. Uh, Aaron has already seen great success with his range of meads and gins and even the world's first mead champagne but it's looking to develop his company even further. Um, hopefully by September, I'm looking to have five employees. Um, so I want to try and do a lot more in the local area because um, I want to try and use as many local produce as possible. So if I can do, I want to try and build up the local area to build local produce. And just like everything in Aaron's brewery, even the name is slightly unusual. OK, so it's a bit of a difficult name. Um, so it's a Zymagorium. Um, basically, it's a, um, a merge of two words, which is Zymergy and Emporium. So next time you go for a pint, you might just find something a little bit different, as a Zymagorium looks to take us into a brave brew era. Lewis Smith, Keys TV News. That's Keys News for now. Thank you, Jan. Goodbye. <laughs>